Put aside everything you thought you knew about being human. After years of rigorous scientific research, evolutionary detective Danny Vendramini has developed a theory of human origins that he believes is stunning in its simplicity, yet breathtaking in its scope and importance. Not only have we had the wrong impression of the nature and behavior of Neanderthals, he argues, but we have been fed sentimental, anthropomorphic images of them as well. Neanderthals, he says, were primitives and would have looked very primitive. There is no reason to suppose they were clean-shaven and good-smelling. The Neanderthals, he expounds, came from the frozen north, they had large nocturnal eyes and were six times stronger than the average modern human. His thesis is that many physical, social, and psychological characteristics now seen as uniquely human are direct results of Neanderthal predation on our ancestors, and the theory will be sure to ignite controversy among any group of people genuinely interested in human evolution. However, many controversial theories were once thought to be crazy. For example, Alfred Wegener's hypothesis of continental drift, put forward in 1915. Wegener's hypothesis was scorned by many at the time and it was not until the 1960s, with the understanding of plate tectonics, that an underlying mechanism to support his hypothesis was provided. Also, Graham Hancock and other researchers proposed theories that were once thought to be crazy, such as comet impacts, and lost ancient civilizations. This theory provides a similarly bold and controversial hypothesis about human origins. But sometimes it takes an outsider to cut through the most intractable problems of science. It is unquestionably the biggest shakeup in evolutionary theory since Darwin, according to believers. This Neanderthal predation theory is the stuff of nightmares. If true, every monster from every European myth, every horror novel, and every scary movie may be derived from memories of the Neanderthal. After all, Neanderthals did have to compete with Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis, who were likely their own ancestors in Europe, so they must have been tough customers. Both of these archaic humans have been found to have killed and eaten other human species, and even their own kind. I think that Homo erectus would have been an even more formidable super predator than Neanderthals. Groups of Homo erectus hunted large prey with nothing but crude spears, so they must have been pretty fearless. Modern humans have been called the third chimpanzee, but, Vendramini asks, why are we such a distinctively unique primate species, anatomically, behaviorally, and why do we have these deep fears? His thesis that intensive predation by Neanderthals forcing evolutionary changes offers insight into the human psyche. He says that the trauma from Neanderthal predation generated the selective pressure, which transformed a tiny survivor population of early humans into modern humans. He cites archaeological and genetic evidence to show Neanderthals weren't friendly omnivores, but savage, cannibalistic carnivores, super predators of the Stone Age. The Neanderthal predation theory reveals that Neanderthals were apex predators, who resided at the top of the food chain, and everything else, including humans, was their prey. You can imagine them using their superior vision to raid Homo sapiens villages under cover of darkness. The theory may be one of those groundbreaking ideas that revolutionizes scientific thinking. It represents a quantum leap in our understanding of human origins. The theory reveals that Eurasian Neanderthals hunted and killed early humans for 50,000 years, in an area of the Middle East, known as the Levant. However, is there any truth to the Neanderthal super-predator theory? It sounds rather absurd at first glance. Well, spoilers, it is just as absurd as you were thinking. The author cites evidence to demonstrate that this prolonged period of cannibalistic predation began about 100,000 years ago, and that by 50,000 years ago, the human population in the Levant was reduced to as few as 50 individuals. There is actually evidence from Israel of sapiens Neanderthal hybrids from this time. Around 100,000 years ago modern humans arrived in Europe and the Middle East. They encountered the Neanderthals, who were a gorilla-like super-predator, six times as strong as the average human, according to the book. These vicious and territorial Neanderthals hunted humans almost to extinction, reducing our population to a tribe of just 50. This forced us to adapt. Those 50 survivors salvaged humankind from annihilation, by transforming into aggressive and predatory human beings. Then spreading across the globe, killing all Neanderthals and Denisovans in their path, until every other hominid became extinct.
This is the current accepted view of what Neanderthals look like. A bit hairier than us, and with a larger nose and thicker brow ridges. But apart from that, they're unquestionably human. In fact, it's been said that if you gave a Neanderthal a shave, a haircut, and dressed him up in a nice suit, he could easily attend Harvard, although he'd need rich parents. There's a couple of things wrong with this picture. First, it's not based on any sound archaeological evidence. That's because soft tissue features like skin, hair, colour and eyeballs are not preserved in the fossil record. The other reason is that after studying Neanderthals for 10 years, I'm convinced they look nothing like this at all. I'm Danny Vendramini, author of Them and Us, How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Humans. In this video, I'm going to draw on the latest archaeological, genetic and forensic evidence to challenge all your assumptions about what Neanderthals look like. There's a reason why all these forensic reconstructions end up looking like humans, and it's got nothing to do with science. I think it's about anthropomorphism. That's our tendency to attribute human characteristics to other animals. It seems to be part of human nature. We assume that because we've got smooth skin, protruding noses, clear eye whites and full lips, then Neanderthals did too. And just because we lost our body hair, we assume they did as well. You can see examples of this anthropomorphic bias in television documentaries and in museum reconstructions around the world. The men are sometimes shown as quite handsome, and often they're even clean shaven. The children are nearly always quite cute, and some of them amazingly even wear diapers. The females occasionally sport trendy tattoos, and they always have breasts, even though not one of the species of primate has permanently protuberant breasts. So you're just left with the impression that we're seriously projecting our own tastes and values onto Neanderthals. Quite apart from the anthropomorphic problem, there's also a fundamental flaw in the technique used to reconstruct Neanderthal faces from their skulls. Now this forensic process works fine on humans, but that's because we know the shape and position of our noses, ears and lips, we know the thickness and texture of our skin, and we know the shape and size of our eyeballs. These soft tissue features are unique to humans. You would never use them to reconstruct the face of a chimpanzee or gorilla. And yet, scientists always use human facial characteristics and dimensions to reconstruct Neanderthal faces. So it's inevitable that you end up with something that looks like a human. It's spurious science. Television documentaries often use actors to portray Neanderthals. This involves hours and hours of meticulous makeup, which the producers assure us is 100% anatomically accurate. But it's not. And one reason is that Neanderthal eyes were in a different position in their skulls compared to humans. They were higher up, about where our foreheads are. Judging by the size of their orbits, or eye sockets, their eyes were also considerably larger as well. So if George Clooney ever had to play a Neanderthal, he'd need to have a serious facelift. And he'd need larger eyes as well. When you actually look at the hard evidence, you soon see that Neanderthal skulls and human skulls were fundamentally different. This is the Neanderthal skull. It's got a protruding face, large eye sockets, and very prominent brow ridges. Compared to a human skull, it's quite different. There's another reason why Neanderthals don't look like humans, and that's to do with the environment. Basically, we know from Darwin that it's the environment that largely determines what an animal behaves like and looks like. In the case of Neanderthals and humans, they evolved on completely separate continents. Humans evolved in the temperate, warm, fertile savannas of Africa. Neanderthals evolved in the frozen glacial wastelands of Ice Age Europe. In fact, the two species, when they met again, had been apart for over half a million years. 
It's inconceivable from a Darwinian perspective that Neanderthals and humans would still resemble each other after half a million years. All this suggests to me that Neanderthals did not look like humans. Which raises an interesting question. What did they look like? Actually, once you get rid of all the anthropomorphic bias and the inherent flaws in the reconstruction technology, answering this question is not particularly difficult. And that's because, ultimately, Neanderthals were members of the order of primates. They were primates. And as such, you would expect them to maintain the appearance of primates. The fact that humans no longer look like their primate ancestors is, I believe, due to completely unique ecological and environmental circumstances, which I describe in my book. These circumstances certainly didn't apply to Neanderthals. So in light of that, you would expect them to maintain the appearance of a tall bipedal primate. Once you acknowledge that Neanderthals were primates, you start to see similarities between them and other primates. For example, when I compared the profile of a Neanderthal with a chimpanzee, they seemed to fit amazingly well. For my book, Them and Us, I commissioned one of the world's best digital sculptors to create a completely new forensic reconstruction based on my theories. We began by scanning the skull of a French Neanderthal. Then, over several months and hundreds of emails and phone calls between Spain and Australia, a creature gradually emerged. Now, saying that Neanderthals look like modern primates is an interesting clue, but it only goes so far. That's because modern primates come in all shapes and sizes. And there's a good reason for that. They've simply adapted to very specific regional, ecological and environmental circumstances. And we would expect the same with Neanderthals. So to create a more nuanced picture of Neanderthal physiology, we need to understand the specifics of their environment. And we know a great deal about that. It was Ice Age Europe, a frozen glacial wasteland, described as the most inhospitable environment ever occupied by hominids. This was the environment that shaped every aspect of their physiology and behaviour. Take the issue of body hair, for example. Were Neanderthals hairless like us? Or did they have body hair like all the other primates? Well, if you look at the animals that lived in Ice Age Europe at the same time as Neanderthals, you see that they all had thick, dense coats of body hair. The mammoth, the woolly rhino, Eurasian cave lion, the cave bear, all had thick fur coats. And that makes sense as an ecological adaptation to the climate. So it makes sense that Neanderthals did too. In Africa, where humans evolved, there was a wide range of prey species that could be hunted. There was also an endless variety of edible plants, fruits, berries, nuts, fungi, and even shellfish. By comparison, in Ice Age Europe, where Neanderthals evolved, there were only about five or six edible plants. And those that did grow there were of such low nutritional value, they weren't worth the time and effort to harvest. This, I believe, forced Neanderthals to abandon their ancestral omnivore eat-anything diet that they acquired from Africa and adopt an exclusive carnivorous diet. In other words, they stopped being hunter-gatherers and became exclusive hunters. But this is where it gets interesting. The prey they were forced to hunt included some of the fiercest, largest and certainly most dangerous animals on Earth. These animals raised the bar and forced Neanderthals to become adept hunters. My contention is that this transformed them over half a million years into the apex predator of Europe. My theory that Neanderthals were flesh-eating predators is supported by new molecular analysis of their teeth enamel. 
This reveals that the Neanderthal diet consisted of 99% meat. In fact, that's all they ate. And there's only one way to get that much fresh meat, and that's by hunting. It also seems that they didn't care where the meat came from. That's because we now know that Neanderthals were cannibals. The first evidence of this actually surfaced in 1906. Since then, literally hundreds of bones have been discovered right across Europe, bearing the unmistakable cut marks of cannibalism. My predator theory also explains why Neanderthals were so much stronger than humans. Their muscles were so large, they had to have extra thick bones to take the strain. It's been estimated that Neanderthals were six times stronger than humans. Even a Neanderthal child could toss a human adult around like a rag doll. It also explains their extraordinary intelligence. Neanderthals were unquestionably the smartest animal in Europe at the time. They mastered fire making, they constructed windbreaks, they made tools and weapons, including razor sharp thrusting spears. And like other social predators, they hunted in packs and used sophisticated ambush tactics to maximize capture rates. But there's one last adaptation that helped transform Neanderthals into such a formidable killing machine. The dark. The vast majority of land-based predators hunt at night because it's easier to catch prey when they're resting or asleep. This theory predicts that Neanderthals acquired larger night vision eyes and pupils to see in the dark. These kinds of eyes reflect light extremely efficiently. It would explain why Neanderthals had such enormous eye sockets. If you think my Neanderthal reconstruction pictures are a bit scary, or the idea of camping alone at night out here in the forest is a bit disconcerting, there's a good reason for that, and it goes to the heart of my Neanderthal predation theory. That's because about 100,000 years ago, a group of European Neanderthals migrated into the Middle East, into an area currently occupied by Israel, Syria, Jordan and Lebanon. Now, living there at the time was a group of ancestral humans. These were timid Stone Age hominids who moved up from Africa. And the evidence suggests that the Neanderthals began hunting them. But not just for food. I believe that Neanderthal males also began hunting human females for sex. Now this horrific period of sexual and cannibalistic predation went on for in excess of 50,000 years. It's this and only this scenario that explains why the 2010 draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome found categorically that Neanderthals had interbred with humans. For our ancestors, being hunted by the most ferocious killing machine on earth was so traumatic, so transformative, that even today we still harbour the genetic legacy of that horrific period of predation. Since the beginning of humanity, these fiendish creatures have haunted the human imagination. They are the stuff of nightmares. They are the monsters, vampires and werewolves of myth, movies and folklore. My research indicates that the only humans to survive were those born with modern human adaptations. Things like high intelligence, creativity, language and aggression. This allowed them to turn the tables on the Neanderthals. For the next 20,000 years they hunted them to extinction. So the basic premise of my book is that everything we are today, everything that defines us as humans, is the result of that extraordinary 70,000 year conflict between them and us. It's what made us humans. I'm Danny Vendramini, thanks for watching, check out the website.